Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. We're praying, O oh Lord, you'll bless us in the study tonight in Jesus' name. Open our hearts to the teaching of your word. In Jesus' name, we pray. For the benefit of our visitors, I want to say that we're in a series of studies. We're not treating the study today because of them. It's what we'll normally deal with, and it's, uh, it goes on in line with what we've been doing. And yet, we do not want to omit the study today or avoid the teaching we're giving today because of them. Uh, this is a belief that we go through the Bible systematically. We go from chapter to chapter and verse to verse. Whether we have guests or not, we still stay on the series we're dealing with. On the one hand, it shows whether we have conviction or not. When we have visitors, whether we can still teach what we ought to teach or whether we'll avoid teaching what we ought to teach so that the people who are just knowing us will not hear that that is what we believe. Why do we go from chapter to chapter and verse to verse? Why do we do systematic study? In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Because every part of scripture is inspired. The believer, the church is not expected to omit or avoid any part of scripture. You go through, you study everything. It's only through that you'll be perfected and made ready for the coming of the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 4 verse 2. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. The challenge the Lord is giving the church is that you will not take away from the word of God, you will not add to the word of God, Wherever you are, any country you are, anywhere you are, you stand on the totality of the word of God. Teach everything that he has commanded. Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 32. What things soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. That's our conviction that the totality of the word of God is what we ought to teach. And therefore we go through the Bible and we teach line upon line, precept upon precept. And anywhere we go, whichever church we cooperate with, all the scriptures we know is what we lay line upon line, precept upon precept. In Malachi chapter 2, reading there from verse 9, God had a controversy with the priests of Israel. And what controversy did he have with them? Malachi chapter 2 verse 9. Therefore have I made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as ye have not kept my ways, listen to this, but have been partial in the law. That means when you teach a part of the word of God, you leave other parts untouched because that part is not is got something people are going to totally accept. And because other churches are not standing on that, and you want to be popular with them, famous with them, and you are partial in the word of God. You as a preacher, you as a minister, God has a controversy with you. Without that background, we go to the study of today. In First Peter chapter 3, we have studied already verses 1 and 2. And today we're looking at verse 3. Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating the air, of wearing of gold, of putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God is of great price. Those verses touch sensitive and essential part of the life of the Christian women. And they reveal the characteristics and the qualities that mark out the spiritual condition of professing Christian women. You'll find as it talks about adornment there, it talks about two parts. There is the outward adornment, there is the inward, hidden, spiritual adornment. Unconverted men and women put all their emphasis on the outward adornment. They have no interest, they have no commitment on the spiritual quality and the spiritual life of a real Christian woman. 
On the other hand, the believers, true believers, those who are genuinely born again, their emphasis, their interest, all their attention is on spiritual adornment, in what holiness, in what purity of heart, a life, a change, a transformation within that gives him cleanliness and moderation without that he is openly or outwardly. As we look at those two verses, we're going to touch on three points. Number one, questionable appearance of so-called Christian women. Number two, the qualities of a truly spiritual woman. Number three, quietness of a transformed, submissive wife. Number one is the questionable appearance of so-called Christian women. In the world in which we live today, you'll find that there are people that call themselves Christians, women or men, young or old, that will not allow the Bible, the Word of God, to affect their outward appearance. The controlling influence in their life is a controlling force and principle in the world, which is pride and vanity. That is what detects the mode and the manner of their outward appearance, outward dressing, outward adornment. They do not understand that it is a God of this world that controls the fad and the fashion of the world. And so when you see them, you cannot differentiate between them. They may be church goers. They may be professing Christians. They may be casual Christians. They may be carnal Christians. They may be careless Christians. Whoever they are, although they carry the Bible, the real life of the believer is not there. They are controlled by the fashions of the world. But we are told in verse 3 that I read to you, whose adorning let it not be the outward adorning of plating the air, wearing of gold, and putting on of apparel. There are people that will read that verse, they misinterpret it, they water it down. They make jest of it, they twist it, and because of their way of talking, they confuse a lot of people. When you read one part of scripture, you go to other parts of scripture so that you have a full understanding, a better understanding, a complete understanding, a balanced understanding. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 9, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. And wait there for a minute. Modest apparel. What's the opposite of modest? Immodest apparel. It means then it's only the graceless so-called uh, Christians, nominal Christian women that will wear immodest dresses. Because if you are a Christian, it must be modest. Dresses such as low neck. That when you bend down, they will see the internal part in the area of your chest that will bring a temptation to the men. Dresses exposing your back, dresses exposing your chest, sleeveless dresses, short skirt, narrow skirt that will so that will show the anatomy of your body that will be so revealing it will be a temptation to the people looking at you. Kinds of dresses you wear that will make the areas of your body that will be attracting to men and uh, that will be tempting to men that will make those areas to be very conspicuous and tempting. That's the modest. If you're a Christian, it's says you will wear modest apparel. Any kind of dress a woman is wearing that will allow your internal, uh, the other parts of her dresses you wear internally, either on top on your shoulder to come out or at the bottom to come out or you wear the normal dress then you tear it, you cut it at the back so as you are walking they will be seeing your lap or they will be seeing your underwear. That's the modest dress. A woman wearing a dress that will button down in the front that has the button uh, you know, uh, either even when it doesn't open, the people that get near you, they'll see inside, and it will be a temptation to them. That's no more modest, it's immodest. And if we're Christians, we have the grace of God. And we are dressing not to please men, not to attract men. We are dressing to please the Lord. And it says, so shamefacedness and sobriety, not loud and lousy, not frivolous and careless. 
not something that makes you look like the public women that are living in sin. Not with broidered hair. What he's talking about? Not with the hairdo of the people of the world at that time. When Paul wrote to them, uh, the people of the world, what they had at that time was broidered hair. And it says, don't look like the world in your hairdo. And therefore today, whatever the name they call it, but Mali or whatever, any other name, once it looks like the world, anybody looking at you will not know that you are a woman believing in holiness and righteousness. Cut it off. Avoid it. Don't let it be mentioned among you. It says a gold appears a costly array. Uh, the gold he mentions there, uh, whether you put it in the nose, or put it in the ears, or put it in your finger, or put it on your toe, or put it on your neck, not with gold, not with pears, or costly array. It's a practice of the world. They want to demonstrate, they want to advertise. They want to show how beautiful they are, how charming they are. They want to turn the mind and turn the heads of the people they see. It says you are a Christian. You are to do all things to the glory of God, not for the attraction of the world. In 2 Kings chapter 9 verse 30. 2 Kings chapter 9 verse 30. And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and tied her head, and he looked as she looked out of at a window. You, you see that all the lipsticks, all the eyelashes, all the things, and the powder, the painting, and the palming, all those things, it belongs to women like Jezebel. If you name the name of Christ, you will not want to be in the same group, in the same society, in the same like appearance with Jezebel. Things will be different in your life. It may surprise you that there are some church people practicing such a thing. Oh, it's not the first time the daughters of Zion in the land of Israel, there was a time they abandoned the way of God and the will of God and the word of God. All they wanted was to attract men. Isaiah chapter 3. There are people that tell us talk about Christ. Don't talk about this kind of thing. I said, talk about Christ. He spoke about a son is given unto us. A child is born. The government shall be upon his shoulder. He talked about his first coming. He talked about his great ministry. He talked about his second coming. He talked about the, all, the, all the ramifications of the life and the ministry and the coming of Christ. But at the same time, the Lord made him to speak about the dressing of the daughters of Zion. In Isaiah chapter 3 verse 16. Moreover, the Lord says, if the thing is so important for the Lord to talk about it, if the thing is so important for the Lord to leave every other thing and emphasize that this is what the Lord says, if you are a Christian woman, if you are a Christian minister, it will be important for you to consider. Because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and they walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes. And you see, the Lord even looks at the way they were walking, and he saw the pride and he saw the vanity, and he rebuked them because of it. And then it says, walking and missing as they go, making a tinkling with their feet. Don't you know what people say? They say all the Lord is looking for is the condition of your heart. Whatever you carry on the head, whatever you put in your ears, whatever you paint on your leaves, whatever you rub on your face, they say that's not the concern of God. My friend, here is what the Lord is saying. The Lord is concerned. It says, therefore, in verse 17, therefore the Lord will smite with his cap the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. In that day, the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet and their cause, and then it says, they are on tires like the moon. You know what people tell us? They tell us not to mention details. They say it's enough as you are preaching. They say use wisdom about it. They say be moderate about it. They say just tell the people, dress sensibly, dress like Christians, and leave the details to them, my friend. God did not leave the details to, uh, uh, to, uh, to the people. He spoke about everything. He named everything. He labeled everything. And he told them, this is wrong. And we do the same thing. We read the scriptures to you. I didn't try the scriptures. I just read it to you and then show you that as people are disobedient and rebellious today, so are they in those days gone by. They say leave them, they say, leave them to the spirit of God. 
they don't have the spirit of God. They don't know the scriptures. We should tell them and read the word of God to them. And if you are there and you are saying, nobody can control me. Nobody can talk to me. I'll wear whatever I want to wear. You are disobedient to the word of God. Hear Isaiah talking from the mouth of God and telling them all the details. And he says, these are the reasons why the judgment of God is coming upon the daughters of Zion. In verse 19, the chains and the bracelets and the mufflers. The bonnets and the ornaments of the legs and the headbands and the tablets and the earrings and the rings and the nose jewels and the changeable suits of apparel and the mantle and the wimples and the crisping pins and and the glasses is talking about fashion and the fine linen and the hoods and the and the veils and it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell there shall be sting. Uh, you, what, what, why were they using all the lavenders and all the cosmetics and all the things is so that they can cover uh, the, the natural odor and God said you are doing fashion all those things I'm going to expose your rottenness instead of the sweet smell you are running after there will be sting instead of a gadol erect instead of well set air baldness isn't that the judgment that has come on many women today? Uh, they go under that thing, you know, they cover, their, they cover them and they put on the heat for them so as to pump the air and eventually before they become 30 or, 30 or, uh, 30 or 35, all the air is gone. They have to go and look for the skin of animal now to, to cover the thing and, they are, they, and then they, they try to call it a good name. They say attachment. Whether you say attachment or goat's air or monkey's air, uh, sin is is sin and it's the judgment of God. First John, reading from verse 15 of chapter 2. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Are we the only people emphasizing something like this? You know our respect for John Wesley. And you know that the doctrine of sanctification and holiness that we emphasize here, actually John Wesley was the one that God made the deep revelation to in the 18th century. And concerning, concerning dressing, here is what John Wesley said. The fact is plain and undeniable. And it says it has its effect upon the wearer and the beholder. He said when you wear those immodest dresses, those sleeveless dresses, those dresses that reveal the delicate part of your body to be a temptation to others, he said, you poison the beholder with far more of the base appetite than otherwise he would feel. He said, didn't you know that this would be the natural consequence of your elegant immodest adornment? He said to push the question home, did you not even desire, did you not design, did you not plan it should be, it should be that way? He said when you dress like that, you kindle a flame which at the same time consumes both yourself and your admirers. He said we need not plunge both you and them into hell. The word of God is very clear then. That if we're children of God and if we're controlled by the word of God and the spirit of God, we'll wear modest dresses. Uh, what are the qualities and the characteristics of real Christian women? In 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 4. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, which is not in that which is not corruptible. He's telling us there that the priceless thing, the important thing, the indispensable thing is that it should be holy in your heart, purified in your heart, transformed in your inner life. And we should know that. That's what Jesus said. Holiness and purity of heart are more important than all those outward things. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Without a holy and pure heart, none shall see God. Without jewelry, you can get to heaven. Without all those cosmetics, you can still live a good life. But without holiness, without purity, you cannot get to heaven. And you cannot live with God in eternity. You know, some outward things are not essential things, important things, needful things. 
the priority of the Christian women should be the maintenance of pure hearts rather than having an outward appearance which attracts the worldly minded people of the world. When you are born again, your life will change. All things will become new. All things will pass away. And the Spirit of God will so affect your life, you'll have a change of attitude, a change of interest. Uh, the things you were interested in before, going to shops, buying this, buying that, looking this way, uh, making the air this way, wanting to attract the people, all those interests, they are changed when you come to Christ. When you are born again, your desires will change. I want to catch the men. I want them to be turning their head when I pass. I want them when they compare me with other women to say, ah, ah, this is number one. I want them to know how wealthy I am, how rich I am, how educated I am, how refined I am, how cultured I am. As they just see my appearance like this, they know I'm not ordinary. When you are born again, all those desires will change. Your taste will change. Your dressing will change. Your appearance will change. And then your relationship with your husband will change. And that's what we are being told here, that the possession of holiness, the possession of a pure heart, is of greater value to the Christian woman than the praise of all the men of the world put together. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23 and 24. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Anything that makes you to look like the world. Anything that makes you to appear like the world. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. When you are sanctified totally, completely, you will not be dressing in a way that will make men to stumble. You will not be dressing in a way that will be giving us those who are leading you, directing your concern, saying, are they not hearing? Are they not paying attention? Is the Spirit of God not convicting them when you are sanctified wholly, entirely? Your life, your comportment, your appearance, your dressing will be something that others will see. It will lead them to Christ. It will lead them to glorify God. It will not lead them to see your body and be desiring anything immoral. And it says, I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body may preserve blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithfully see that calleth you who also will do it. Can he do it? I said, can he do it? When he does it, everything will change. And then in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 4. In the second part there, it says, Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which in the sight of God of great prize. Let's see, leads us to point three, quietness of a transformed submissive wife. It says, the quality in the life of such a Christian woman will not be that she is noisy and quarrelsome. It will not be character, characterized with impatient action and incessant argument. But you'll see the meekness and the gentleness and the quietness of spirit there. And that's the quality we find in a woman like Mary. In Luke chapter 2 verse 19. Luke chapter 2 verse 19. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. The quiet spirit, the lowly heart, the meek and gentle spirit, the one that takes after the nature of Christ. And that's not only for women, it's for women and men. In Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with lowliness and meekness, with long suffering for bearing one another in love. What the Lord is telling us is that the spiritual life should be more pronounced than the outward appearance. You see the things the Lord has revealed to us today. What's to be my attitude? What's to be your attitude? In Job chapter 34, I'm reading to you from verse 32. Job 34, verse 32. That which I see not, teach thou me. If I have done iniquity, I will do no more. There's the attitude of a real child of God. Oh Lord, I'm sorry, I didn't know that. I didn't know it was wrong. I did it in the integrity of my heart. 
Somebody tried to tell me I thought he didn't understand. And so now I'm going to make right my way. All those perforated uh, dresses that reveal uh, my nakedness, all those transparent dresses that reveal my nakedness and their temptations to people that see me, Lord, I'm going to get rid of them. All the kind of hairdo, all the kind of makeup, all the kind of appearance that makes me to look like all those people of the world and they cannot even know that I belong to a holiness church. I didn't know. I'm sorry. I see the seriousness now. That which I see not, teach thou me. If I've done iniquity, I will do no more. All those costly dresses, the things that the people of the world wear in their wedding or in their funeral or in the naming ceremony that will show, oh, don't you know where he's walking? Don't you know how rich they are? Don't you know that they have enough and to spare? All those things that marks of the rich people of the world that they you, you think now you're on the ivory tower. I know that's pride. I know that's vanity, the vanity of the world. I am sorry. That which I didn't see before. Now I see. I know I've done iniquity. I will do no more. All the arguments of the past is sanctification, I believe, is Holy Ghost, I believe, is healing, I believe. All that kind of the, the, what they talk about dressing and air do and air cut, all that doesn't concern me. It's only this, I believe, and you are partial in the word of God. Oh Lord, I'm sorry. Now I surrender. I give myself to you. I'm going to obey you. The Lord has taught us tonight. And if you are meek, the Lord will keep on guiding you. In Psalm 25, verse 9. The meek will he guide in judgment and the meek will he teach his way. If you are not meek, if you are not receptive, if you shake your head and say, no, I don't want that, the Lord will leave you to your reprobate mind. But it's when you come before the Lord, you say, Lord, I know I've sinned. I know I've gone astray. I know I've not been careful enough. I know I've not been a very vigilant on my dressing. Now I'm going to take your word. Then you are meek and the Lord will continue to shower his grace upon your life. Are we willing to make corrections? I said, are we willing to make corrections? Why don't you rise up then and tell the Lord, Lord, that which I see not teach thou me. If I've done iniquity, I will do no more. Some of you women can destroy the ministry of your husband. These are challenging days. These are wonderful days of opportunities. And some of you women, by your dressing, you can destroy the chance that your husband has in serving the Lord more effectively. And some of you men, too, by your action, by your appearance, by your dressing, you may make the people of the world not know the difference between you and the people of the world. As you are praying, be visualizing and looking at your wardrobe at home. All the bottles of cosmetics there, what are they doing there? All the clothes you are ashamed to wear to church and you are wearing to occasions outside, what are they doing there? All the clothes your heart condemning you, you say you are deeper life, you say you believe in loneliness. How about this one? What are you going to do about them? You are pretending you are using style to use jewelry. It's not on your ear. Is it not on your neck? It's not on your ear. Is it not on your wristwatch? It's not on your ear. Is it not in other parts? Where do you stand in the presence of God, in the sight of God? And you women, are you making a young men to, to, to fall because of your appearance? They look at you and they commit fornication with you in their heart because of your appearance. Why don't you nail that thing to the cross, crucify that flesh, so that you will appear in such a way as to glorify the Lord your God. Check up your life. Are you men to check up yourself? Are you dressed only to glorify God, to exalt holiness, to help other people to know the Lord more, and to help people to appreciate holiness? Tell the Lord today you will change. You will not dress just carelessly. Everything you do, everything you say, the way you appear will bring glory to God. And will make people to see the beauty of holiness, not the beauty of cosmetics.